What does your brain, yeah, that squishy thing that's inside your head, right here, and this plastic bag have in common? Well, at first glance, not a whole lot. I mean, this bag can't think. It doesn't have millions of neurons firing through it constantly. And it's not even gooey or slimy. Unless, of course, you filled it with fruits and veggies and then forgot about it and left you in your car in the boiling hot sun for weeks and it started decomposing and turning into this thick, mucusy slime that leaked all over everything and then... Sorry, that's a story for another day. But what this bag can do is bend. It can twist. It can expand and compress. Basically, it can reshape itself to adapt to its environment or to new changes, much like your brain. This concept is known as neuroplasticity, the neurological capability of your brain, along with the ability to reshape and mold like plastic. And today, you're going to learn all about this amazing concept and how you can use it in your classroom to educate. My name is Maynard Okereke, also known as the Hip Hop MD. I'm an engineer and a science communicator, and I am so excited to welcome you all to the Spark of STEM Coffee Break series, an online series designed to inspire educators with innovative STEM tips, tools, and resources they can use in the classroom. And the best part is that you can be an educator at school or even at home. All of the downloads and resources you need from this episode are available online, and you can download them using this QR code. And trust me, you'll want all of these tools because today's episode on neuroplasticity is going to expand your mind, like literally. But you're not going to learn it from me. We have the neuroplasticity expert herself, Emma Bleakman, here to give you all of the mind-blowing details about how you can incorporate this in your classroom. Emma holds a master's degree in neuroscience and education from Teachers College, Columbia University. Her passion for education has taken her across the globe, teaching in Honduras, Austria, Germany, and Haiti. She completed her bachelor's degree in elementary education and global studies at Purdue University and spent three years teaching third and fourth grade at a national blue ribbon school. Emma, our brains are all yours. Take it away. Hi, Maynard. Thanks for the introduction. I'm so happy to be here today. Today, we're going to be talking about neuroplasticity, and you may have heard of the term before, or it might be completely new to you. Either way is totally fine, because you are an expert at supporting neuroplasticity in your classroom. And so I will give a crash course into what neuroplasticity is and how it relates to education. But the bulk of this video is actually to teach your students about how their brains learn so that we can empower them to take ownership of their learning. So if you are looking for ways to support your students to become lifelong learners, keep watching, this video is for you. The brain has around 100 billion neurons and over 100 trillion synaptic connections, which allow us to think, feel, and do. Our brain's number one goal is to survive. And so we have a biological mechanism that allows our brain to adapt structurally and functionally to an ever-changing world. And this is called neuroplasticity. It's the brain's ability to adapt and change. Now we have to remember that neuroplasticity isn't inherently good nor bad, it simply is. It can be really helpful, like during learning and rich experiences that help through development. However, it can be harmful, like when the brain adapts to diseases and disorders. Thankfully today, we are going to be talking about neuroplasticity in learning and development and all of the helpful ways the brain can change and grow. Dr. Hagar Goldberg is an educational neuroscientist at the University of British Columbia, and she compares neuroplasticity to Vygotsky's zones of proximal development. And I find that this is a way that really resonates with teachers and makes it click. So just to give a brief overview of what Vygotsky's zones of proximal development are, there are three different zones that children can be in when they're learning. The middle zone is when students can do a task independently. The next ring is when they can do the task with help. And then the outer ring is when they can't do the task at all. Another way to think about these zones is the middle ring is comfort, the next ring is stretch, and then the outer ring is stress. 
And the middle ring, comfort, is when there's not enough cognitive challenges, but there are the resources and support students need. The outer ring, which is stress, is when students are in a survival mode. The challenges are far too much and there aren't enough supports and resources available. The middle ring is where Dr. Hagar Goldberg says, neuroplasticity is enhanced and learning is maximized. And this is where we want to be, where there is a balance between cognitive challenges and supports and resources students need. Now, before we move on to teaching students about how their brains learn, I want to say this very clearly, that you support students' neuroplasticity in your classroom so well. Let me give you some examples. You create an atmosphere in your room that is safe and warm and inviting. You make sure you get to know students beyond just learners in your classroom and really as humans. You make sure that there's a really great balance between cognitive challenges and the supports and resources they need to thrive. And finally, you know that a surviving brain is not a learning brain. And so you advocate for the basic needs that these students need. You make sure that they have food and snacks during snack time, and you make sure that they have a warm coat before they go outside. So now let's get started with how we can teach our students about neuroplasticity. I'm going to break this into three separate parts, and all of these activities can be scaled up or down depending on what your students need. I'll do my best to try and give some ideas and reminders throughout, but know that you can change this and differentiate it in any way that serves you the best. So the first part of this activity is explicit instruction. The second part is an activity that demonstrates the biological mechanisms behind neuroplasticity. And the third part is an activity that really gives students a better sense of the behavioral side of neuroplasticity. And finally, because I couldn't help myself, I added in a literacy extension that you can do with students K through 12, totally optional, but it's there if you need it. So the first part of this lesson is the explicit instruction. And this gives students a really good foundation of terminology, vocabulary, before they move into the activities. Thankfully, brainfacts.org has a phenomenal video that does a really great job of showing how neurons communicate. If you are in K1 and 2, you can definitely show your kids this video. The visuals are incredible. They may not understand the full depth of it, but that's okay. If you are in some of the upper grades, you can extend this and have conversations about some of the biological mechanisms that are discussed in this video. After students have watched this video, you can jump into the first activity, which is separated into two parts. The first part is electrical signaling, and then the next part is chemical signaling. So to demonstrate electrical signaling between neurons, you'll have students line up in a row. And in this row, they'll all be holding hands, and the very last person will be the one to say, done. That'll make sense in a second. The teacher will be timing and writing the times on the board so that students can see, and students can follow along with a worksheet as well. Now, it's three rounds. Round one is they're all holding hands, and the first student says the person next to them's first and last name and then squeezes their hand. That signals that it's then the next person's turn. They say the next person's first and last name and then squeeze the hand. This continues all the way until it gets to the last person and they say, done. The teacher then stops the timer, writes the time on the board, and we move on to round two. Round two, students don't have to say first and last name. They just have to squeeze the hand. And so you can imagine this is going to start getting faster. Again, once it gets to the end and the person says done, teacher writes the time on the board and we move to the final round, which is round three. This time, not every single person is holding hands, only one in every four people. So the first person and the fourth person, they'll be holding hands and that continues down until the end. And they just squeeze hands and it ripples until it gets to the last person. You can imagine this is going to be the fastest round. So the teacher will then write the time on the board and that activity is done. 
you can briefly ask students what they notice, what they wonder, but we're gonna save the bigger discussion until we're done with the chemical signaling as well. So for this activity, you'll just need two resources. You'll need either cotton balls or the little pom-pom craft balls. You can even rip up paper and have students help you make little like paper balls in whatever way you can get creative. It just depends on the resources that you have. So this one, students are separated into two separate sides. The first group represents the presynaptic neuron. The second group is the postsynaptic neuron. And the cotton balls or the pom-pom balls represent neurotransmitters. The students in the postsynaptic side represent the receptors that are catching the neurotransmitters. So round one is for 30 seconds, the presynaptic side is tossing the cotton balls. Thankfully, we're not gonna use anything hard, so no harm will be done. But they're tossing cotton balls or pom-pom balls for 30 seconds. And half of the students in the postsynaptic group can catch the balls with their non-dominant hand. Once they've caught in a ball, they can go and put it in the back of the room in the trash can. Now, you can imagine that not many balls will probably be caught. But let's go to round two. Same structure. 30 seconds, presynaptic side is tossing the cotton balls at a constant speed for 30 seconds. The postsynaptic side this time has half of the students, but they can use their dominant hand. So maybe they're able to catch a few more cotton balls. And this time the trash can or the bucket, whatever you choose to use, is going to be just slightly closer, a few feet, doesn't matter. And so maybe they catch more cotton balls this time. Now the third round, similar structure, they're throwing the cotton balls, but this time everyone in the group can catch them. And the trash can this time is just a little closer again. Now, the fourth and final round, same structure, throwing the cotton balls, but all of the postsynaptic group can catch them with both hands. So they can use two hands this time and the trash can is right next to them. You should be imagining that there's going to be a trend of an increase in cotton balls or pom-pom balls. And this is where you can have a discussion with your students. What did they notice from both of those rounds? Why did electrical signaling get faster? Why did the chemical signaling get stronger? These are the same mechanisms represented in our brain. When we do something with repetition and practice, the electrical signaling and the chemical signaling begin to strengthen. Now, the next activity is more of a behavioral version of neuroplasticity. And I love this one because they often double as brain break breaks as well. So what you can have students do is a very small activity every day for five to 10 days, depending on when you start to see results. And students will notice that they are getting visibly better at this. And you can say that this is exactly what's happening in your brain that we just did in the biological demonstration before. So I like to have students hold up a OK sign and a peace sign. And as quickly as they can, they're going to switch. Now, I make it look easy. Some may say I'm an expert in this. I've been doing it for years with my kids. And then you switch again and you keep doing it. It's going to be hard at first. I couldn't do it for the longest time, but that's the point. If they're able to practice this every day, they're going to get better. And that's what neuroplasticity is. There are changes happening in their brain to support this skill. You can also have students draw a circle with one hand and a square in the other, and you can see how they grow and progress with that skill as well. There's lots of different things you can do with this. So if you have an idea that you wanna use in your classroom, you are welcome to. Sometimes I like to do writing your name with your left hand and seeing how you progress in that, but do what works for your students. Now, the final round, which is the bonus round, is a read aloud called A Walk in the Words. And this is an incredible book. It's an autobiography. And it's about how this author really enjoyed drawing pictures as a child, but they didn't so much enjoy reading and writing. 
And they realized that they just had to face that difficulty head on and practice and try and try again. And it's a really cool ending because he has published over 27 books. The writing is beautiful, metaphorical and figurative language. And there's so many great things you can do with this rich text. I've created a four day lesson plan and a one day lesson plan you can do if you choose to do this. I think it works for K through 12. You'll definitely have to change and scale it depending on what your students need. But I gave a, a overview structure of how this can be done in your classroom. Thank you so much for spending this Spark of STEM coffee break with me. I hope that you learned something about yourself and something that you can do with your students. I hope you know that you are an incredible educator. You do so much to support your students' learning and growth. I hope this off also showed ways that you can teach your students about their own learning, because at the end of the day, learning happens within and by the students. Thank you again. It was a pleasure to be with you today. If you need any additional resources about neuroscience, brightlightneuro.com has an entire unit dedicated to neurons, the size of neurons, genetics and experience, how to consume neuroscience information that are all available to you for free. Thanks again, and I wish you all the best. Wow. Thank you, Emma, for that enlightening session about neuroplasticity. Hopefully, all of our educators watching at home or in their classroom found some amazing takeaways on how they can incorporate this into their classroom. Also, don't forget to check out our incredible speaker, Emma Bleakman, online for more STEM learning inspiration. We hope you enjoyed this session. And next time you look at a plastic bag, perhaps you won't think of it as just a simple piece of plastic filled with old, decomposing organic matter. Maybe you'll look at it like a truly majestic work of art, a neurological masterpiece that can be reconditioned and rewired to do some absolutely phenomenal things. Just don't leave it in the back of your car on a hot summer day. <laughs> Thank y'all for watching. See you next time.